reading from the book of the prophet Baruch. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever. Wrapped in the cloak of justice from God, bear on your head the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. For God will show all the earth your splendor. You will be named by God forever. The peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Up, Jerusalem, stand upon the heights. Look to the east and see your children, gathered from the east and the west, at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Led away on foot by their enemies, they left you. But God will bring them back to you, borne aloft in glory, as on royal thrones. For God has commanded that every lofty mountain be made low, and that the age-old depths and gorges be filled to level ground, that Israel may advance secure in the glory of God. The forests and every fragrant kind of tree have overshadowed Israel at God's command. For God is leading Israel in joy by the light of his glory, with his mercy and justice for company. The word of the Lord. There I was in the Aquinas Institute Library, mid-September, it's a beautiful day. I'm holed up, of course, a new student, and I'm studying for our uses of philosophy in theology class. I'm looking at an assigned reading from St. Gregory of Nyssa. He has an important work, it's called The Great Catechetical Discourse. So I'm in the midst of a section where St. Gregory is arguing that humankind came to be made in the image of God. And it's a section two where Gregory says, man was made with a good nature, that this nature was fashioned by God, and that humankind came to be among good things. Furthermore, this is a little more interesting, he says that human nature is free, and this is one of the best of these good things. We're wonderfully free, and that we have an ability to self-determine, we have a sort of independence. Now, these kinds of things we've probably heard before, some of us, for years and years. Maybe it's new for others of us. And these truths, they're foundational, but they might not strike us. It was the same case for me. I'm going through the reading, and in this little section talking about freedom, I noticed that Gregory asked a question. He's asking a rhetorical question. How would human nature be called the image of the kingly nature if it were under yoke to and enslaved by some necessities? How could it be appropriate to call human nature free if it's enslaved by things? And we see this. <laughs> but I just picked up on the image of the kingly nature, and it made me stop. Made in the image of the kingly nature. What does he mean? That's a pretty powerful little phrase. And his observation that we're made in the image of the kingly nature, it resonates really well with our scriptures today from Baruch. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever, Baruch says. God will show all the earth your splendor. You're wrapped in the cloak of justice from God, Bear on your head the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. And further on, God will bring them back to you, borne aloft in glory, as on royal thrones. Now, lest I be accused of being undemocratic, I don't think this concept of royalty is exhaustive and gets at everything, but there's something important being communicated to us here that we are the children of a king. You are the child of a king. 
And as I was pondering this truth in the library, I had the image of a little one, a boy or a girl, wrapped in the blanket from their bed, playing pretend, going around, sort of uh, maybe comically, but in freedom and joy and excitement around their house, uh, giving themselves maybe a new title, princess or duke. And parents, I think, often delight in children's freedom and playfulness in things like this. And it's getting at something true. When maybe we did that, when we dressed ourselves up and pretended to be a part of royalty, we were touching on something that is in accord with this freedom that we're given by God, our Father, who is a king. And this reading from the Old Testament, I think we can find it prefiguring many things in the New Testament, but I thought in particular of Paul's words to the Romans. He says, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. that royal theme is coming up again. We're being encouraged to take this on, to live in light of the truth that we are the children of a king. And there's a lot of joy and excitement in this. It makes many of the cares and worries of our lives actually seem a lot more insignificant. When we have this kind of freedom, it's powerful. It helps us to navigate the trials that often come our way in this life. Now still, someone might say, isn't this a little too sunny? I mean, this is, you know, really nice and all, but we're, we're in the midst of a world that's really suffering. People are not living really free lives. We're facing continued and recently renewed uh, fear of disease. There's an embittered sort of divisiveness in our socio and political lives. And we've seen senseless killings right in the heart of our country. Now, interestingly, Gregory, in his writing, hundreds of years ago, centuries ago, anticipates an objection like this. And he says that the present existence of human life in absurdities, we might call our situation absurd, it's not a sufficient refutation to say that man has never come into being among good things. Now, why not? The answer most powerfully comes at the end of our Advent season, and it's Jesus, also a son of this King, the Father in heaven, who comes to be with us. He comes as a little baby into the earth that's full of darkness, He suffers the weaknesses, the difficulties, the affliction that are a part of each of our lives. And his coming into the world is going to end up resulting in his death, as we will die one day. But this death is a death on the cross for our sins. And ultimately, in exaltation, it leads beyond this death into the resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. He goes there to be seated in glory, dignified, in accord with this royal freedom that the Father is ready to bestow. We can get there too. And St. Paul's passage from Romans ends with the key to how this is accomplished. If only we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him.